Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to day two of the 2021 American Constitution Society National Convention. I'm Russ Feingold, the president of ACS, the foremost progressive legal organization in the country with more than 200 student and lawyer chapters across the nation. Our chapter leaders are the heart of this organization. And so it's my pleasure now to introduce you to one of our many stellar next generation leaders. Natasha Martinez, who just last month graduated from the University of Missouri School of Law. Natasha? Thank you, Senator Feingold, and good afternoon, everyone. It is my honor and pleasure to introduce our featured speaker today, Secretary of Homeland Security, Alejandro Mayorkas. As you likely know, Secretary Mayorkas is the first Latino and the first immigrant to lead the Department of Homeland Security. As the daughter of an immigrant myself, I have grown up witnessing the value of immigration, both to the immigrant and to the United States. I saw my dad become a United States citizen and take part in his first democratic election. And just a few weekends ago, my immigrant father got to watch two of his kids walk across two different graduation stages in just one weekend. Immigration programs like Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals which the secretary helped to develop and implement, and refugee programs make walking across stages, voting, and even becoming Secretary of Homeland Security one day possible. Defending the homeland requires an understanding of our need for effective security and a commitment to our constitution and its values. Secretary Mayorkas has been described by those who know him as a person uniquely prepared for the job. He is the first chief of the United States immigration system charged with protecting the very same system that provided refuge to his own family six decades earlier. He brings a deep empathy for immigrants rooted in his own family's extraordinary journey from Europe to Cuba to the United States. And he has a well-founded appreciation for the freedom and security this country can offer. As the secretary said in remarks upon being nominated to lead DHS, the department has a noble mission to help keep us safe and to advance our proud history as a country of welcome. So today, I am truly delighted to welcome Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, proud immigrant, American citizen, and noble servant to the United States of America to the 2021 ACS National Convention. Natasha, uh, thank you very much for the beautiful introduction. Uh, that I will try to live up to. And congratulations to you for all that you have accomplished, including uh, your graduation from law school. Thank you. Natasha um, referenced uh, my upbringing a little bit. And uh, let me start off by commenting on, on that. Uh, my parents, uh, my mother and father, brought me to this country when I was almost one year old um, in an effort to escape communism and the opportunity to raise their children in a democracy. My father lost his country of origin, his home, his small business, and really um, everything that he had planned for his young family. It was the second time uh, in my mother's life uh, that she uh, became a refugee. Uh, she fled Nazi Europe uh, during the Second World War. And so, uh, I grew up with, with a very strong sense of uh, my identity as a refugee and what it means uh, to be displaced fundamentally in one's life. When I became the director of U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services in the Obama-Biden administration, I, I traveled to Kenya, uh, to Nairobi, uh, to see the refugee services there. And in the course of that trip, we took a small plane to the Kenyan-Somali border to visit the refugee camp of Dadaab, Dadaab which um, was at that time um, the most understrained, under-resourced, and most dangerous refugee camp uh, in the world. And as we took the plane from Nairobi to Dadaab, all one could see for miles and miles and miles was desert. And when we arrived at the camp, I could not understand how people, families, 
with small children, even individuals without family could arrive safely to the camp, traversing that barren desert with nothing on their backs, but they managed to do so. And I saw families sleeping on the desert sand with either a paper bag or a plastic bag over their head as roofing and nothing else. And when the sun set, the pitch dark settled in and there was no electricity and food was shipped in twice a week. I sat in on an interview of a family that was hoping to seek refuge in the United States. And one of, immigra one of the immigration officers in the agency that I led was interviewing the family, a mother of father and four children, the eldest of whom was 17 years of age. And the refugee officer asked that young woman, the eldest of the children, where she was born. That was the first question that was posed to her. And she looked puzzled at the refugee officer and said, I was, I was born here. I was born here in Dadaab. And for 17 years, for her entire life, she had known nothing but sleeping on the sand under a paper or a plastic bag, having food shipped in. And I returned to the States asking a lot of fundamental questions, certainly about whether we could define ourselves as a civilized world or not, but also asking questions about myself and whether I was indeed a refugee in the most profound sense of the term. How could I liken myself or use that title when I had just experienced or seen what I had seen. And the question of identity became much more profoundly important to me as an individual, as a son, as a brother, and as a father and a husband. But it also became very important to me as a leader of an organization. And the issue of identity became the central question when we were wrestling with policy issues. When we consider a particular policy question before us, doesn't the answer help define our identity, who we are, and more importantly, who we want to be? And, and so I asked, when we were in fact confronting difficult policy questions, the question of identity. What, as we struggle to reach an answer, what would the answer say about who we are and who we want to be? And I think that there are two foundational or guiding principles uh, that really drive the answer. One is the concept or actually the element of dignity and the other is the rule of law. Those are two foundational guideposts. As I seek to lead an agency, as we, um, as servants of the law, uh, seek to bring justice in whatever uh, we do. And here in the Department of Homeland Security, I think um, that must guide everything that we do. And I think that Thus far, um, we've had some very significant successes, but we also have confronted and will confront uh, challenges. And I wanna speak about the issue of identity, the guiding principles of dignity and the rule of law in a few of the mission sets that we have and share with you my thoughts in that regard, just to bring, it, uh, to bring this uh, to life in the issue of immigration. I think that we, um, we are trying to uh, ensure that the lives of the families that were separated in the prior administration reflect 
the dignity that they have always had and that we then failed to recognize. And so we are reuniting the families with the sense of urgency that that mission deserves. In looking at our detention facilities uh, that um, uh, involve uh, considerable uh, and challenging issues, there were at least two uh, that I studied, at least two that I studied, that I felt did not uh, respect the dignity of the individuals who were um, in custody within them. And so we closed them. That individuals who are subject to removal under our immigration laws uh, still must be treated with the dignity that they deserve as human beings. And the treatment of them that we were engaged in did not reflect that fundamental fact. Sometimes language is so very, very important. I happen to think it's always important, but in the immigration space, uh, we issued um, a directive that the term illegal alien should not be used unless one is citing to the particular statutory language that exists, but we should refer to those individuals as non-citizens to reflect that their lawful presence or their unlawful presence in the United States does not define their dignity as individuals, but is separate and apart from that fundamental question. In the challenge, in the area of challenge, we are dealing with an immigration system in which we um, address uh, the legal rights and responsibilities of children who very well uh, may not be represented by counsel. And I find it um, frankly abhorrent uh, that we can proceed uh, to remove a child uh, who does not have counsel by her or his side. And so that to me reflects not only a failure to um, respect the dignity of that child, but it also speaks to the fact that our system as a whole lacks dignity in that regard. We've made an inroad to some respect, in, in some respect. We promulgated recently a guidance to the lawyers in the office of the principal legal advisor to make sure that that lawyer on behalf of the government brings justice in that immigration courtroom. And justice means making sure that the rights of that child are brought forward when there was no one by that child's side to do that for the child, her or himself. When we speak of the rule of law, I think um, uppermost in my mind, um, in addition to those a few things that I've mentioned, is the prior administration's public charge rule. The fact that um, individuals who are seeking immigration benefits as the law provides may render themselves ineligible by seeking uh, public benefits uh, that the law also provides them. And I felt, and we collectively in the department felt that the rescission of that rule uh, would not only restore dignity uh, to the process, but adhere to the rule of law. The executive branch is granted certain discretionary authority. The law so provides. And so we reinstituted and are strengthening the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals or DACA program. What I think um, means uh, bringing meaning and action to the rule of law. It's not only in the area of immigration that I think these fundamental questions are brought to the fore. If we take a look at our security, our national security or homeland security enterprise and in the security arena specifically, I have articulated previously that I think the greatest threat, terrorism related threat that we face in the homeland is domestic violent extremism. 
need not we as the Department of Homeland Security, as a key federal player in this effort to combat domestic violent extremism, must we not exhibit the very dignity that we hope our communities um, embrace and exemplify? And so um, I directed an internal review uh, of uh, our workforce and our practices to make sure that uh, no one within our own uh, midst um, engages in such domestic violent extremism. I am mindful, of course, and guided by the First Amendment uh, principles uh, that our Constitution um, uh, grounds so deeply in our lives and in the fabric of our country. But um, uh, it is not without any limitation. And so, for example, an individual who is um, uh, exercising immigration enforcement uh, activities or, or rights has to be mindful um, that the articulation of ideologies of hate directed at immigrants will could or will impair the integrity of that officer's actions. And we have a responsibility to make sure that that integrity is unencroached um, and um, uh, has um, the confidence of the public. When we speak of domestic violent extremism, the rule of law dictates that we cannot um, encroach upon the First Amendment right, people have the constitutional right to articulate ideologies, uh, no matter how pernicious or, or offensive we might find them. But we are focused not on the articulation um, uh, of those ideologies, but the connectivity between those ideologies and um, acts of violence. Even um, in the battle against COVID, issues of dignity um, are foremost in our efforts. We are dealing with communities um, uh, that suffer uh, tremendous inequities that are often disenfranchised. One of the foundational principles that President Biden has articulated in the dissemination of vaccines in the extension of a helping hand is to make sure that the concept of equity is achieved, that no community and no individual is disenfranchised in being able uh, to access uh, the vaccine. And so we, through FEMA and our, our federal partners, have gone into those communities and ensured our accessibility uh, to those communities to ensure uh, that not only our efforts, but their needs um, receive uh, the dignity uh, they deserve. Um, we uh, must deliver uh, on these foundational principles, not alone and not unilaterally, but in concert with the public we serve. Um, we were very, very concerned and um, um, because of the empiricism uh, before us, of the burdens and barriers that the prior administration imposed on people's access to immigration benefits to which they could qualify under the law. And so what we did was we issued a request for information from the communities we serve, from the public, with respect to how we could overcome those burdens, how we can eliminate those barriers. And we received more than 7,000 responses. And we will engage with the public and we will review those responses so that we can collectively uh, achieve that mission. Um, in the government, we have the privilege of um, seeking to make systemic change, to bring dignity, or I should say to reflect in what we do, the dignity of the people we serve on a very impactful and systemic basis. But we cannot forget that the rule of law 
that the law as an instrument of delivering dignity um, can bring that to a single individual. And we cannot um, understate uh, the importance of doing so. And I think that sometimes the impact on one individual um, uh, can reverberate throughout an entire institution and bring systemic change. And I want to read to you, um, as my final words, uh, a note uh, that we received at U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services to speak of the impact on an individual, uh, to communicate um, what we can do to ensure uh, that through our actions, we recognize and respect the dignity of every individual and what it means to administer the rule of law um, in the best traditions of our country and in adherence to the principles of our constitution. Dear Mrs. Officer, I want to inform you that I received a letter of approval in regards for my application in this great humanitarian country. Madam, I want to thank you and thank this great nation of giving me a chance to find a refuge for my life and to protect me from being harmed and from death. I want to show my endless appreciation and deepest regards to you and your time and consideration to help and save me and protect me in a way that made me feel that I'm a human with rights to live and have a future. May God bless you for being my guarding angel and may God bless America for saving me. In addition, I want to express my family's thanks and especially my mom who want to tell you that she wouldn't forget you in her prayers and their appreciation for saving a son and a brother. And I wouldn't forget you as long as I live and I wish that I will be given a chance to repay the United States of America for its protection. The fundamental principle of dignity and the rule of law as an instrument to deliver it. Thanks so much. Well, thank you so much, Secretary Mayorkas. Um, you know, we appreciate your leadership as the Biden administration works to repair our immigration system. But I know I and I'm sure everyone watching found those remarks to be sensitive and moving and thoughtful. And yet at the same time, you conveyed in a short period of time some very useful, specific information that shows what a seriousness of purpose you have and, and your tremendous leadership skills. We are grateful. Thank you so much, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Senator. To everyone watching, we are grateful to have you all joining us today and throughout this week. Your generous support makes our work possible. And as, as Zanel mentioned yesterday, we have a great new way to give. Just pick up your cell phone and text to 1-855-575-7888. In the message text, 252212. This is a quick and easy way to show your support for ACS and the progressive legal movement. Before we turn to our panel discussion today, ACS is very honored to announce that we are establishing a new annual award that will let Professor Kate Andreas tell us about. And after Kate, Judge Paul Etkin of the Southern District of New York will announce the winners of our annual Cudahy Writing Competition on Regulatory and Administrative Law. We are grateful to Judge Etkin himself, a clerk of the late Richard Cudahy, who I have to mention, of course, hailed from my great state of Wisconsin. And we also thank the rest of the judging panel for their efforts in selecting this year's winners. Hi, I'm Kate Andreas. I'm a member of the ACS Board Academic Advisors and have been a faculty advisor to the ACS student chapter at the University of Michigan Law School. Last year, the nation lost an icon and the ACS community lost a role model. Through her work as a judge and justice, Ruth Bader Ginsburg helped create a more equal and just society. 
not only for women, but for everyone. Her majority opinions gave people the ability to determine the path of their own lives. And her dissents showed us what a more just society could look like one day. Justice Ginsburg appeared a number of times before ACS audiences, including at this very convention a few years ago. There, she told those in attendance, I don't think the meaning of feminism has changed. It has always been that girls should have the same opportunity to dream, to aspire and achieve, to do whatever their God-given talents enable them to do as boys. Women and men working together should help make the society a better place than it is now. While Justice Ginsburg's judicial career is widely heralded, her academic experience and accomplishments are less well known to the public and even to some in the legal community. But before she became the notorious RBG or even Judge Ginsburg, she was Professor Ginsburg. She began her academic career at Rutgers Law School where she co-founded the Women's Rights Law Reporter, the first legal journal in the country to focus exclusively on the field of women's rights law. And she taught a class on women in the law among the earliest taught on the subject in American law schools. Later, as the first tenured woman at Columbia Law School, she introduced and taught the school's first sex discrimination law course and co-authored a casebook on the subject. Her groundbreaking work in academia opened the doors to generations of women scholars, lawyers, and advocates, and changed the legal profession forever. When 50 years ago in Reed versus Reed, the Supreme Court held that the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment prohibited discrimination on the basis of sex. It was Professor Ginsburg's brief that won the day. For these and many other reasons, ACS would like to honor Justice Ginsburg's memory and pay tribute to her legacy by establishing an annual Ruth Bader Ginsburg Scholar Award. The award will recognize an outstanding scholar in the early stages of their academic career who has demonstrated those qualities exemplified by Justice Ginsburg, scholarly excellence, the ability to imagine how society might be more just and more equal, and the determination to use the law and one's scholarship to creatively and strategically make the imagined real. Our first recipient will be announced at this convention next year and will receive a prize of $5,000. Details can be found on the ACS website. I wanna thank my fellow committee members who worked this year to establish the award, Justin Driver, Dahlia Lithwick, Melissa Murray, Micah Schwartzman, Neil Siegel, and Julie Sook, and our collective thanks to, Jane's, to Jane Ginsburg for blessing this endeavor. We look forward to announcing the first recipient at next year's convention. Thank you. I'm Judge Paul Etkin of the Southern District of New York. As a former law clerk to Judge Richard Cudahy, I'm honored to present the winners of the Richard D. Cudahy Writing Competition on Regulatory and Administrative Law. This competition honors Judge Cudahy's distinguished service as one of the nation's finest appellate judges. From his appointment to the United States Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit by President Carter in 1979, Judge Cudahy served as a circuit judge for 36 years, developing a national reputation for his thoughtfulness as a jurist, his fair-mindedness, and also his deep interest in administrative law and its impact on social welfare. Before announcing the winners, I would like to thank my fellow judges for this year's competition. Judge David Hamilton of the Seventh Circuit, Professor Jack Bierman of Boston University College of Law, Deepak Gupta of Gupta Wessler, Professor Miriam Sifter of University of Wisconsin Law School, a former winner of the competition, and Allison Ziv, Director of Public Citizen Litigation Group. Every year we give two awards, which come with a cash prize, one for the best student paper in administrative law and one for the best lawyer paper in administrative law. This year we had a particularly impressive group of papers submitted in both categories. The winning submission in the student category this year is The Problem with Public Charge by Joseph Duvall of Yale Law School's class of 2021. The winning submission in the attorney category is Litigating Welfare Rights, Medicaid, SNAP, and the Legacy of the New Property by Professor Andrew Hammond of the University of Florida College of Law. Both of the winning papers this year make outstanding contributions to the field by exploring the real world impacts of administrative law on the lives and well being of ordinary people. 
Finally, I would just like to thank ACS for its terrific work administering this competition, and also to thank Judge Cudahy's family and so many of his former law clerks for their support. Judge Cudahy devoted his career to ensuring that the law is a force for good for all people. And I hope that through this competition and the work of ACS, we continue to honor that legacy. Thank you and congratulations to our winners. Congratulations to our award winners. Hello, everybody. I'm Deborah Perlin, a Director of Policy and Program at ACS, and I have the pleasure of introducing our next panel discussion, Advancing an Anti-Entrenchment Agenda, How to Save Our Democracy by Deconcentrating Wealth and Power, which will be moderated by Ellie Mistel. Ellie is the nation's justice correspondent, covering the courts, the criminal legal system, and politics. He is also the force behind the magazine's column, Objection, and is a frequent guest on MSNBC and Sirius XM. Ellie is a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Law School, a former associate at Deba Boys and Pimpton, and a lifelong New York Mets fan. Ellie will introduce our panel. Welcome, Ellie. Thanks so much for having me and welcome everybody to our panel about entrenchment, which I don't know, seems kind of relevant just at the moment. As Deborah said, my name is Ellie. I'm the justice correspondent for The Nation. Before that, I was the executive editor of Above the Law. And I generally hate it here, right? Like I hate where the country is um, right now. And I find, I find myself, you know, kind of battling bouts of depression uh, um, as one does. But I try to remember that, you know, things look pretty tough for a brother in 1857 too, right? Like right after the Dred Scott decision, things probably weren't looking so good. And people still got themselves off the mat and pushed the rock. So let's talk today about pushing the rock about getting ourselves up off the mat and trying to break through what seems like an entrenched uh, array of forces against us um, at the federal level especially um before i introduce the panel i want to do some quick housekeeping notes uh, for those of you seeking CLE credit for our panel, as I know many of you are, um, we will be posting a link um, in the chat box at the end of the session, which you will take to a Google form that you must complete in order to obtain credit. I will be required to provide two codes. I will provide the first code at about the midway point of this panel. Hopefully somebody will remind me to do that. Um, and I'll provide the second code at the end. You need to provide both codes to get the credit because that's how they get you. Um, okay, with that, let's uh, go to our panel introductions. You have all already met Kate Andreas. Um, she is a professor of law at the University of Michigan Law School, Go Blue. Um, although she will be leaving Ann Arbor and joining the faculty of Columbia Law School this summer, I know they have a football team. I'm not very aware of their record at the moment. Um, her research focuses on labor law, constitutional law, um, and problems in the political and economic equality. Um, Professor Andreas is um, a member of the ACS Board of Academic Advisors, as she said, and an ACS faculty advisor. Um, our next, next panelist is Josh uh, Chaffetz. Um, he is a professor at the Georgetown University Law Center, where his research focuses on structural constitutional law, legislation, and legislative procedure, and the intersection of law and politics, which is kind of the whole ballgame, right? Um, and the American uh, political development. Um, our next panelist is Janae Nelson. She is the Associate Director Counsel of the NAACP's Legal Defense Fund, where she helps to determine and execute LDF's strategic, strategic vision. Janae is also a renowned scholar on voting rights and election law, which are kind of important just at the moment. Um, our last panelist is Sandeep Vahisan. Um, he is the legal director of the Open Markets Institute, which works to promote greater awareness of the political and ec economic dangers of monopolization. Previously, Sandeep worked for the CFPB um, and was and has published articles on a wide variety of topics in antitrust law. So DOJ antitrust, DOJ antitrust division, if you guys still exist, um, hopefully you are listening. <laughs> um, Welcome all of you. Thank you so much for uh, joining us in this discussion. Josh, I want to start with you with the uh, $50,000 question on the table. Um, since you, I literally have read law review articles now by you on this subject. What do we do about the filibuster, which seems to be president of the United States right now? 
Well, what we should do is is get rid of it. I mean, it's a it's a um, it's it, it, it's hard to come up with any good purposes that it actually serves. Um, you know, people talk about it as if uh, um, uh, it serves purposes like you know uh, uh, promoting debate or things like that. When in fact, it does exactly the opposite. Right? When something's being filibustered, it's not being debated. Uh, essentially, all it serves as is a minoritarian veto, which is, you know, it would be bad enough if the Senate were sort of correctly apportioned, but as it is now, you have a minority of the Senate representing an even smaller minority of the country that essentially uh, can, can um, uh, indefinitely obstruct with almost no effort on their part, uh, just about anything that they want to. So um, uh, it is uh, you know, one of the worst, I think, uh, forms of political entrenchment that we have at the national level. I think it should absolutely uh, be abolished. Uh, um, uh, you know, unfortunately, we have um, uh, at least uh, two Democratic senators who are um, uh, sort of not interested in being the pivotal vote, but rather in being protected from taking difficult votes. And so we don't have the political will at the moment at the, at the, in the Senate to abolish it. Um, but uh, uh, I think in order to pass any kind of uh, really important transformative legislation, it's going to have to go at some point in the relatively near future. Kate, you're a constitutional law professor, filibuster. Not in the Constitution, actually. Um, is there is there a principled reason for why it's still here, or at least why it's still here for this in this form, or is 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 this just is just this uh, uh, is this just a relic um, that needs uh, that needs to go? Um, I agree with Josh. It needs to go, and it's worse than a relic because it's actually something that has gotten increasingly minoritarian over time. So in fact, um, the smaller states in the United States have gotten smaller and smaller relative to the bigger states. So the problem of this sort of disproportionate representation that a, a given senator has um, in a small state has grown. And so with that change, the filibuster becomes even more problematic because a very small number of people control the future of the entire country. Um, and uh, so point number one, and point number two, the use of the filibuster filibuster has changed over time. Um, so that it used to require actual physically speaking and filibustering in a way that raised the stakes and engaged senators in a debate, and it no longer does. And so um, it needs to go, and it doesn't require a constitutional amendment to get rid of it, contrary to some other problems with our democracy. Indeed. Um, Janae, you all know that the filibuster um, comes from a very uh, uh, racially charged past. This was a this was a Jim Crow era idea to 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 re to arrest progress um, in this country. Is, is do you have an argument for for saving it in any way, or, or are you um, on the on the it needs to go train? Yeah, I am the conductor on the it needs to go train, in <laughs> fact, um, or I wish I could be, frankly. Um, no, you're absolutely right. And and I agree with, with the other panelists. Not only is it not a constitutional mandate and not only is it a historical invention on accident, but it actually perpetuates an insidious racial, racial skew, you know, in part due to the malapportionment of the Senate, but also the operation of the filibuster over time has really borne that out. The filibuster uh, has been used with regularity throughout history to block the civil rights of black people in the United States to undermine our constitutional ideals. Um, this has been used to defend slavery, to protect segregation. You know, if you think about um, the 40 times that the filibuster was used from the time it was introduced in 1837 and the creation of cloture uh, in 1917, 10 of those issues were uh, of racial import. And if you go further into the 19th century, you find pro-slavery senators using the filibuster to block measures. Um, you find uh, 30 times that the filibuster was used to um, to to block or sorry, 15 times that it addressed civil rights issues and and uh, racial equity, including banning anti-lynching bills. So it, we to, if you look behind the numbers, there are actual people there who were made more vulnerable, who were killed and whose lives were uh, permanently altered, them and their communities, because this instrument that again, is not a constitutional mandate, was used to block protective legislation. And sadly, we see it being manipulated today to block critical legislation for our democracy. 
Sandeep, you know, one of the arguments that people make in favor of the filibuster is that it protects rural interest. It it, it, it stops kind of aggregation of power in, in, in large population states and in urban centers. Um, does that argument hold any water with you? I mean, I know that, for instance, Senator Kristen Sinema has recently said that she doesn't want to get rid of the filibuster because she doesn't want to destroy democracy. I might quibble with her math. I think 57 should beat 35 in a democracy. Um, um, but you know, math and numbers aside, is there any does, is there any water in the argument that the filibuster actually protects rural interests um, and low population communities from the alleged uh, tyranny of the majority? None whatsoever. So the filibuster is deeply anti-democratic. You know, New York has more people than Wyoming. California has more people than Montana. You know, in a truly democratic or representative democracy, population matters. So the fact that New York has much larger uh, congressional caucus than Wyoming is not a problem in and of itself because New York has a much larger population. So unless you have a very peculiar idea on who is actually being represented in Congress, the filibuster is a deeply undemocratic uh, institution and needs to go, just like the other panelists have said. And nobody's talking about disenfranchising uh, residents of Wyoming. They still have two senators. They still have representatives or maybe just one representative in Congress. So the filibuster has to go. It can't be justified in any sort of commonsensical popular understanding of democratic governance. Okay, really quick kind of lightning uh, round style. Are, are you guys all on the kind of abolish the filibuster um, train or do you think that there's uh, some utility um, in reforming the filibuster? I've written, um, for instance, that we need to uh, reform the filibuster. You know, people don't understand it wasn't always 60 votes, right? We could have a filibuster that required 55 votes. We could have a filibuster that required 52 votes. And then as, as Josh, uh, as Kate mentioned, actually, um, you know, the filibuster used to cost something, not just the, the kind of Jimmy Smith's talking filibuster, but it used to, you know, the the when we talk about reforming the filibuster, what we're really talking about is reforming the cloture rules, right? Re reforming the rules to make it harder for the minority to in to to deny cloture while they're you know on a train back to Vegas. So. Um, kind of let's go, I'm just gonna go up and down my stream, Kate, are you, do you think we have to abolish it entirely or do you think that there is some way, some method, some utility in reforming it, keeping this general idea, but in reforming it in some way? Well, I don't think there's a really good argument for keeping it at all, but I do think that um, there are a number of reforms short of abolishing that would be helpful and that would improve the current situation. And you mentioned several of them. Um, another would be limiting, uh, eliminating it for certain kinds of legislation, for example, democratic democracy enhancing legislation. So those would be God, improvements. I'm trying to remember, I feel like there was a party that eliminated the filibuster just for a certain kind of thing, like nominating Supreme Court justices for life. I think that happened like in my lifetime. Uh, Josh, are you, are you for reforming it or abolishing it entirely? Well, I'm, I'm for abolishing anything that looks like the, the modern filibuster entirely, right? I mean, as you said, the question really, you know, to, to, when you're getting into the specifics, the question is what you want to do with cloture, right? Because the filibuster um, isn't really one thing, right? The, 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 um, uh, in the sense that, you know, a lot of things that are being filibustered in some meaningful sense never have cloture votes and therefore don't show up in the cloture statistics and things like that. So I think to the extent that, that the sort of cent the core of the modern filibuster is a indefinite minoritarian veto on, on the movement of business through the Senate, I think it needs to go. Now, that doesn't mean that we need to either uh, move to a previous question regime like the House or necessarily even lower the cloture threshold to 50. You could have something like a declining filibuster or a, or a low, you know, some threshold somewhere between 50 and 60. And as Kate said, those would be a, a improvements. Um, but I think as long as a minority in the Senate can hold things up indefinitely, um, that's a problem. And to me, that is the core of the uh, late 20th, early 21st century filibuster. Janae, reform or abolish entirely? Uh, I think abolition is necessary, but the re political realities suggest that what's most likely is some form of reform if we can achieve it. And I think that carving out the exception that Kate mentioned, which is to allow for democracy expanding legislation to pass or fail on a majority vote is really what is required in this moment. And I, I have faith that with that democracy expanding legislation, we can rely on the American public 
to continue to press their representatives to enact the legislation that uh, you know will suit their needs and will best represent their wishes and desires and hopes for the future, and will perhaps uh, defang the effect of the filibuster because you know the majorities will begin to reflect the will of the people. Um, the talking filibuster really requires uh, some modicum of shame and some uh, 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 idea that uh, forcing a particular party or defenders of, of legislation to continue to talk will either make them tired or embarrass them into retreat. And I'm not certain that we can rely on that. So those sorts of um, you know modest reforms around the process of the filibuster, I think, are certainly not enough to get us where we need to be as we stand at a moment of democratic crisis and we need federal legislation to pull us you know, away from the cliff. I, look, Janae, I tend to agree with you, but there, I guess I'm not, and definitely there are some people that seem to have no shame, but I, I just remembered you know, Ted Cruz reading Atlas Shrugged on the Senate floor um, and, that, and that not working out well for him and, and people kind of understanding, wow, Cancun Cruise, that's a thing, right? So like, I don't know. I, 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 I guess I haven't fully given up on the concept of shame, um, which I really think is something that's been lost in our society. I think I think shame. We were we were better off when we had <laughs> when we had more shame. Um, Sandeep, uh, what you got? You got you, any any love for for the Jimmy Smith uh, uh, version of things, or, or do we, does does this just need to go? The filibuster needs to go. It should be abolished. And there are really two things. You know, the Senate is already. Uh, an undemocratic institution. We don't need to make it even more undemocratic with rules like the filibuster. And I think defenders of the filibuster also like to pretend that if the filibuster went away, we'd have sort of unchecked crude majoritarianism. But that's that's not true. Bills would still have to get through both houses of Congress. The president would have to sign bills before they became law. And we'd, of course, continue to have elections to every two, four, or six years, depending on the office. So I don't see any case for retaining the filibuster. I'm so glad you said that, because that's one of the things that bothers me the most when I hear these pro-filibuster arguments from certain senators who shall not be named. Um, they say that we need the filibuster to you know, restore the checks and balances in the Constitution. That's not true. The thing that was supposed to check the Senate in the Constitution is Article 2 and Article 3. It's right there. The Senate is not supposed to check itself through anti-democratic structures. It's the other these the other centers of power in our government that are supposed to check the Senate, and they are able to check the Senate quite well, we, it turns out, most of the time. Um, Kate, I want to move to you, because Sandeep really set this up perfectly. Um, um, moving beyond the filibuster, there's this other problem that's called the United States Senate, which, it's, which is in the Constitution and was set up <laughs> was set up this way on purpose in the Constitution. And as not a lot of students know, Article 5 of the Constitution says that we can't actually change through constitutional amendments the, the unrepresentative structure of the Senate. So given what the Senate is, is given those kind of iron uh, sides of the Iron Triangle, Kate, is there any way for us to reform the Senate, to make the Senate more democratic and more representative um, and less gridlocky um, than what we see, um, you know, mainly throughout my entire life, but certainly over the last 10, 20 years? Well, um, I mean, I think I'll let maybe my co-panelists, including Josh, who's an expert in the Senate, speak to some more details. But I would say that one sort of... Um, you're right, the, the obstacles for reform are really significant here, um, but one uh, reform that would advance the ball um, would be to make sure that all citizens of the United States have representation in the Senate, and currently uh, those in the District of Columbia don't. So that would be um, one small but really important way to improve the representational um, kind of function of the Senate. Sandeep, you said earlier Wyoming still would have two senators. That's kind of the problem, right? Um, so, so what do we do about that? Yeah, in my ideal world, we wouldn't have a bicameral legislature. We'd have a unicameral legislature like Nebraska, and you know, Canada and the UK effectively have unicameral uh, legislatures today. But I do think that the focus on the Senate as an institution is giving cover to some of the right-leaning Democrats in the Senate caucus. Uh, so, most notably, Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema, but others. You know, we've seen. Uh, reports that you know the two Delaware senators oppose raising the federal minimum wage. So 
it is partly a matter of the Senate as an institution, but it is partly a composition of their caucus. Uh, even if we reform the Senate, let's say abolish the filibuster entirely, it's not clear whether we would have 50 votes plus uh, Vice President Kamala Harris to actually pass many of the uh, legislative priorities for both the Democratic Senate leadership as well as the Biden administration. Josh, at the risk of sounding like a Roman emperor, I am definitely on abolish the Senate train. Um, but but what do you what what is there a way to 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 if not save this institution, fix the institution so it's a little let a little it's a little less of an entrenchment force um, in our politics. Well, I mean, so I think, you know, uh, uh, Kate really hit on one of the sort of few ways that it could be made somewhat more representative uh, of the United States without uh, sort of uh, change at the level of constitutional text, which is uh, adding more states, you know, as, as, a, as, a, as a resident of the District of Columbia, I'm all in favor of, of that um, uh, uh, for, for DC, for Puerto Rico, if, if the people want it. Um, uh, and for other uh, jurisdictions that are that are currently unrepresented in the Senate, I think that would uh, not only uh, sort of at a matter of, as a, at a level of individual justice, you know, every American should be represented in Congress, but it would also make um, uh, Congress more rep it would make the Senate more representative, um, uh, uh, even of ju ju the, the the places that are already uh, uh, represented, because it would um, uh, make the partisan composition of the Senate more closely mirror uh, that of the United States. Um, uh, you know, once you start getting into sort of uh, more fundamental changes, like uh, trying to make uh, the Senate closer to proportional or something like that, you 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 run into sort of problems with constitutional text. Um, that said, you know, we, we start out talking about the filibuster. I think that has to sort of come back into this conversation, right? In the sense that, um, uh, uh, as bad as the malapportionment is, the the, the filibuster magnifies it even further. Janae, do you have interesting solutions to, to make the Senate more democratic and, and less kind of um, protective of, of minority rights, or, or, or are we just stuck with it? Sure. I mean, we're, we're not stuck with it. There are obviously ways to amend the Constitution, but those are, as we all know, are difficult hurdles to clear. Uh, some of the most, you know, I think, uh, viable ideas have already been discussed, and that is the addition of D.C. and Puerto Rico if uh, uh, Puerto Ricans are... are decide that that's the self-determination they, they want and, and including other uh, territories and jurisdictions. Um, but this is just an inherently uh, uh, indefensible construction in our, in our democracy. I mean, it has always been undemocratic by design and the shifting demographics and population distribution of our country has only made it more indefensible than a modern democracy. It, it, it overrepresents white people and a particular political party um, in, in ways that are, are can't really be justified uh, other than the fact that it's entrenched in our constitution. And so we really do need to rethink if we're thinking about uh, what the future of our multiracial, multi-ethnic democracy looks like and, and how we perhaps need to refound our democracy, the Senate would be an arcane artifact that absolutely needs to be thrown out and and restructured with something uh completely new okay i'm gonna leave article one aside for a second although i will just last point that i'll take a moderator privilege to make another thing that we can do people is to change congress right like the congress is set at 435 seats because they ran out of seats in the building i am not making that up and one of the things that limiting Congress to 435 seats does is that it also um, de it also anti-democratically underrepresents certain people. Congress should, in fact, be much bigger. I think if we use the formula that we had at the founding, we'd be somewhere in the 700s or 800s in terms of Congress people. An 800-person Congress would better represent this country than a 435-person Congress. So, like, don't don't forget that Congress. While we focus on the Senate as an anti-democratic institution, Congress is limiting itself to 435 seats. Is also an anti-democratic uh, 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 holdover um, we have in this country. But like I said, I want to move on from Article 1 specifically, and I will also say we are at the mid point. So for those seeking CLE credit, the first code for today's panel is KEY11. That's K-E-Y 11, uh, which you can also find placed at the bottom of the screen. As a reminder, you'll need this code. That, um, you need this code and the one that I'll provide later to get CLE credit. Okay, after that commercial break, don't forget stamps.com. It's great. No, wait, different kind of show. Uh, 
Janae, coming back to you. Okay, Article One aside. Article One is what it is. We are we are entrenched on those levels as we are. You LDF boots, legal boots on the ground. What else can we do to kind of get around Article One? Where do we go um, to kind of break the gridlock if we can't um, take a frontal assault on the U.S. Senate? Well, uh, there happens to be two bills that we could consider passing. Of course, we've already talked about all the ways in which those are uh, now halted, at least at the moment, because of the filibuster threat and because of um, the, the malapportionment that is reflected in the Senate. But we have to, in this moment, uh, figure out a way to get away from the hyperpartisanship of uh, that has taken hold of our democracy. And one of the ways to do that is to pass the For the People Act to create nationalized standards for voting, to bring more people into the electorate and to protect that right to vote more fiercely through federal legislation, uh, which only affects federal uh, elections, but will certainly have a trickle down effect and uh, uh, encourage states to um, operate one system that will make elections fairer for everyone across the country. In addition, there is the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, which updates the Voting Rights Act of 1965 in response to the Supreme Court's decision in Shelby County versus Holder uh, in 2013, which also uh, helps uh, remedy some of the discrimination that we see in voting and particularly in the area of redistricting, which is yet another way in which we entrench partisanship and another very um, anti-democratic process, not in, in, in theory, but in the way that it is practiced because the Supreme Court decided not long ago that partisanship can basically run amok in the redistricting process with no check from the judiciary. I, I understand if you, because of your position, can't answer this, so, so if you can't, just tell me and I'll, I'll respect that. Um, but I just have to add, do you really think that the current Supreme Court will uphold the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, given that this is the, these are largely the same people, perhaps more of them now, um, that eviscerated the Voting Rights Act the first time around? I actually do. And, and I say that because, uh, you know, Chief Justice Roberts invited Congress to update the Voting Rights Act and asked for a new, um, a new basis for uh, uh, requiring jurisdictions to seek federal pre-approval of any new voting laws. And if you look at the record that's being built to support the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, it is responding to just that. So of course, the, uh, this, this Supreme Court, which one then decided uh, Shelby County versus Holder in 2013, could part from that precedent and suggest something even more radical and unattainable by Congress. But if there's any fidelity to that decision, which for the record, I do not agree with, but if there's any fidelity that are set forth in that decision, then I do think that the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act meets those requirements and can pass constitutional muster. Interesting. Okay, uh, Sandeep, what other forces outside of changing the Senate um, do we need to, to kind of attack to break through some of this gridlock? So I think the, 800 pound uh, gorilla or elephant, which are random we prefer, uh, in the political room is large corporations, specifically the Fortune 500. Uh, so they exercise power over us in our capacity as consumers, workers, small business people, and fundamentally as citizens of a nominally democratic society, they have huge armies of lobbyists, they shape the parameters of discourse or helping decide, you know, what are acceptable reforms, what reforms are simply off the table. So if we believe in you know, a true electoral democracy, we have to address corporate power because at, not, at present, you know, they have an effective veto over so many areas of law, whether it's antitrust, labor, employment, consumer protection, environmental. The co members of Congress fear them. Uh, back uh, in the wake of the Dodd-Frank Act, um, you know, Dick Durbin uh, famously said that, frankly, Wall Street owns the place. And I don't think that has really changed since then. If anything, it's gotten even worse with the Trump administration uh, further removing restrictions on uh, corporate power and prerogatives. So I think a, a real democracy agenda uh, has to be paired with, a, with, with an anti-corporate uh, and uh, assault on corporate power agenda. The two really go hand in hand. 
Kate, is there a way um, um, to break through some of this entrenchment um, beyond the Senate? Absolutely. I mean, I think an additional democracy enhancing reform, in addition to the ones that Janae were talk was talking about and related to the problem that Sandeep was raising was, is the problem of, of really having working people have more power in the democracy. Um, and we need reforms that enable working people to organize, uh, to have, uh, to have power at their workplaces, to have power in the economy over decisions that affect how we allocate resources and to have power in our governance. And in order to do that, we need stronger organizations, stronger civil society organizations and stronger unions. And so reforming labor law is essential to enable workers to really have a democracy um, in their everyday life and to be able to exercise power in the democracy. And here again, there is a bill uh, that's in Congress, um, the PRO Act, um, but, but, um, but part of this is also just organizing movements and and um, and working to enhance the ability of working people to organize as workers, as tenants, as uh, debtors at every level of our uh, of our society. Josh, where are we missing? What else? What, what else is a is a factor holding us back that we haven't talked about yet? The courts. Um, so I, I I wish I could uh, could share uh, Janae's optimism about what the courts would do with uh, new voting rights legislation. Um, but you know, before we had Shelby County, we had Namudno where they said, you know, where they said, oh, it's okay because there's a bailout and we can just bail out the county rather than, than strike it down. But, uh, Richard Ray has a, a great law review article called The Doctrine of One Last Chance, uh, where he points out that this is a move that John Roberts has made repeatedly over time where he'll, uh, he has a decision where, he's, where he sort of uh, uh, tees up an issue but doesn't quite go all the way. And then four or five years later, he'll go all the way in the, in the next time it's presented. I, I, I don't see, um, uh, it, it strikes me that this court um, uh, it would be likely to strike down any um, uh, uh, sort of attempt to reimpose preclearance, pre which, uh, you know, to be very clear, I think preclearance was perfectly constitutional. I think there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. But, you know, you look at all the language about the, the dignity, the equal dignity of the states, right? Um, uh, uh, but not only that, you look at the fact that, you know, for the majority of the court in Shelby County, right, they thought this was a case about the 1787 Constitution, right? It's only when you get to the dissents that you even find out there are Reconstruction Amendments. It strikes me as implausible <laughs> that that court, and not even that court, right, a court that's several clicks to the right of that court, is actually going to uphold any additional voting rights legislation, right? It's the same court that gives us Rucho. Um, uh, um, it's the same, I, I, you know, I'm worried that, that if we get a repeat of the Arizona um, uh, independent redistricting case that, you know, that came out 5-4 upholding just the constitutionality of a state choosing to have an independent redistricting commission, I'm not sure that comes out the same way today. Um, so frankly, I think uh, a lot of the reforms we're talking about, and then, you know, I think we can move into lots of other substantive areas of law that are not about democratic processes where the court is going to be equally hostile to anything, um, uh, any kind of progressive reforms. So I, I think you know, uh, um, this is all going to run into the sort of, uh, to, to even if we can get it through either state legislatures or, or uh, uh, somehow Congress, this is going to run into the buzzsaw of, of the Supreme Court. This is my next topic. And, uh, you know, we, we were not going to get through an ACS convention without talking about the entrenchment of the courts in case you were wondering. Um, so, Josh, let me stay with you. Uh, you. I think you laid out the 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 potential problems we have with the current court um, quite well. What do we do about it? Because you know what, what, what I see, quite quite frankly, and it's not just. I mean, you were you were focusing on the Supreme Court, but as you well know, it's not just the Supreme Court. We've got we've got an entire federal judiciary um, that was stacked at a record record pace by the previous administration. Um, the, we don't always have progressive energy um, on on the side of of just even acting as quickly. Um, as previous administrations, to say nothing as acting as incisively as pre previous administrations. What do we do with a body that cannot be voted at? That 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 is literally, you know, you know, people who are appointed, you know, last in 2020. Uh, some of them will outlive me. Um, um, granted, I'm not the healthiest person, but you get my point. Like, wh what do we do about that? So, I mean, you know, options are limited. Obviously, we're not going to get um, significant court reform through Congress anytime in the near future. And frankly, if we did, I wouldn't be shocked if the court found a way to decide that was unconstitutional, too. Um, so I, 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 um, I think part of it, right, is you, you just hope for, for actuarial luck uh, in some sense. Um, uh, right, I mean, you, you try to hold the elect, you try to hold the presidency for long enough, uh, and and the Senate often enough that that um, uh, that you can sort of appoint enough of the judges at some point, right? I mean, in this regard, 
uh, progressives have just have partly been incredibly unlucky, right? That that um, uh, in the, you know given the number of years they've controlled the presidency, they just haven't gotten as many vacancies as Republicans have gotten over the last half century. Um, Starting in in 2016, in 2020, we've had 16 years of um, Democratic presidents and 16 years of Republican presidents over the past 32 years, and yet the Supreme Court is 6-3 with justices appointed by Republicans. Some of that has definitely been um, bad luck. Some of that has been bad decisions though, right? Some of that Absolutely. has been people perhaps not retiring when they should have. Uh, could be a mistake that we're about to make right now. Um, Kate, I'm gonna skip over you because I know that you are part of, 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 of a new kind of effort uh, to, to look at this issue. Um, uh, Janae, what, what do we do? I mean, <laughs> it's kind of the same question that I had to Josh. Like, what do we do about the fact that we've got this kind of long-term generational imbalance on the courts, and yet even people on the courts kind of seem to not see it that way, seem to not be willing to kind of uh, wrestle with the political realities of our judicial system? Uh, listen, it is a very desperate situation and there is no um, immediate answer. There's been lots of talk, of course, about uh, expanding the courts and, and considering not only adding additional seats to the Supreme Court, but also expanding the number of seats on, on various circuit courts. Um, you know, and there's an absolute demand and need, at, at certainly at the circuit court level, uh, for additional judges and greater access to ju justice, which can happen both at the trial court and appellate court level. So um, whether that's the creation of an additional circuit, whether that's expanding the number of seats on various circuits, I think those are real viable options that serve an independent purpose um, and, and should not be uh, should not be saddled with any partisan baggage. Um, but the reality is that our courts are are not reflective of the general population. There is a real crisis of integrity um, in terms of the American people's. Uh, belief in in the impartiality of our federal judiciary system, and so we, like you know, the crisis in Congress, need to take this crisis quite seriously if we want to ensure that people continue to follow and uphold the rule of law. That that people continue to believe that a, a court issued judgment is sacrosanct and ought to be followed. And um, there will be a point at which we have to. For just the, the 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 sacredness of these courts, um, there has to be some interest in self-preservation and ensuring that uh, there is, at a minimum, a veneer of impartiality and integrity that that the public can believe in. And so, you know, while I agree with Josh that, uh, listen, we do not know what this court would do in this current composition with with any democracy expanding law, but to um, you know, to to hold these laws unconstitutional or to reach um, a conclusion in, for example, the case that's pending before the court now out of Arizona, the Bronovich case uh, concerning Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act would be such a blatant assault on uh, the, the rights of minorities and our democracy that I, I've got to hope that the court doesn't want to be that transparent with its motives if, if those are, in fact, um, what ultimately they would like to do. For those flying along at home, the Judicial Conference, which is an independent collection of federal judges, I think they've said that we need, what, 75 new district court judges today just to, just to do the work. Uh, um, we haven't expanded the lower court since, the 19, since 1990, um, which is uh, nearly a record uh, since we started uh, kind of adding lower, lower courts um, to our country. Um, and that's just a straight like docket workload thing. Mm -hmm. And this idea, at least of expanding the lower courts, this is bipartisan. There's a bill from Mike Crapo to do this um, in Idaho. Granted, it's part of a general effort to break up the Ninth Circuit, blah, 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 blah. so because they think the Ninth Circuit is too liberal for Ohio, for for Idaho. But honestly, at this point, like, do you really care? like adding another circuit, especially during a Biden administration, seems like a good enough idea to at least roll the dice with, right? Like, if if but it's it's that people and generally people on the left, generally progressives, are not always aware of how much of a, of, a, of a crisis we're in just in terms of bodies on our lower courts to say nothing of the long-term generational changes um, at the Supreme Court level. Sandeep, I want you to spend a couple of minutes playing uh, Sheldon Whitehouse for me. 
Um, <laughs> because right, whenever we, we talk about courts, we don't talk enough about the money that is put behind by certain institutions, right? Um, the money that is put behind judicial nominees and, and shaping truly the debate in this country about what a Supreme Court or lower court justice even looks like. Talk to a little talk to us a little bit about how big money influences um, our judicial our, our judicial branch. Yeah, so the right wing in, in this country recognizes that it's sort of long-term institutional base is the federal judiciary, the least democratic branch of our government. You know, they're, they recognize their agenda is deeply unpopular. It's, it's elitist, it's white supremacist, it's not in the interests of the multiracial majority. So their long-term success depends on controlling the least democratic branch of our government, the, the judiciary. And they were extraordinarily successful during the Trump administration, getting three Supreme Court justices, hundreds of lower court judges, and they've been extraordinarily successful in setting the terms of debate around the judiciary. So the, the judges and justices that have been appointed by Republican presidents have been extraordinarily activist, uh, reinterpreting statutes, manufacturing constitutional principles out of whole cloth. And yet they've somehow marketed these hard right judges and justices as practicing judicial restraint, embodying judicial humility, when in fact it's the, the liberal justices who are more likely to defer to uh, legislative text, uh, legislative history, and recognize that the function of judges is not to play super legislators, but to actually allow the democratic branches, Congress and the presidency to exercise their enumerated powers in Congress. So they've completely uh, inverted the terms of debate. They have turned uh, you know, up is down, uh, war is peace, through decades of successful propaganda where someone like uh, Brett Kavanaugh, or going back earlier, Antonin Scalia, who are hard right, uh, view their role as advancing their ideological project, uh, depicted these people as somehow humble or practicing restraint, which is just completely removed from the truth and their actual records. And they've done it with a lot of money. I mean, like, let's, 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 I mean, it's, it's very obvious to me, you know, like this, when you get like a liberal billionaire, what do they want to do? They want to either make a moon colony or run for president. Like that, that's what liberal billionaires want to do with their funds, right? When you get a conservative billionaire, what do they want to do? They want to control the courts and they put money into organizations that will help them control the courts. They seem to get it. And so Kate, I think I can get you in her here on this and if I'm wrong, let me know. But I think I can get you in her on this. Why do you think that we've had this long-term asymmetrical war? Why is it that, do you think that conservatives are able to kind of understand that the courts entrench their power um, while progressives don't seem to understand um, that the courts are the way to break through that entrenchment of conservative power? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, I think one explanation is that at least some progressives are really committed to achieving change through democratic action. And so that leads to less emphasis on trying to control the courts um, and more on trying to enact legislation and build and, and work through the executive branch and through um, uh, state legislatures as well and through building um, movements. Now, as you point out, there are costs to that strategy because because the courts have so much authority in our current system. Um, even if one doesn't think that is necessarily required by the constitution, the reality is that given the way, uh, given the, the, the way things are in our country, the courts have such outsized power. So, um, but I do think that some of the explanation has to do with, it's just um, that, that uh, progressives have focused more on sort of the democratic process and less on trying to kind of capture and entrench uh, um, uh, views through the courts. Um, new topic, and Cindy, if I want to start with you, I don't think I've started with you yet. Um, uh, tell me a little bit about um, what role the media has to play in the entrenchment of our politics. Um, I, I, I find it kind of very obvious um, that corporate media has a lot of money invested in keeping kind of the things, the horse race, the both sides kind of where they are. That makes people that makes the people go click. Um, um, and that makes people uh, 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 turn, tune their dial. Um, wh what role do you think the fourth estate has um, in, in what we're in, in what we're battling against um, in terms of gridlock in our politics? 
Yeah, so corporate media is a, a major upholder of the status quo, just in the way in what they cover, how they cover it. So I mean, just looking back over the past 10 years, they gave Donald Trump extraordinary amounts of coverage, even very early on in the 2016 primary. And, you know, in contrast, uh, in, in the Democratic primary, you know, Bernie Sanders was a serious contender, didn't get anywhere as much attention from the press. So there is a tendency among among the media, mainstream media, which is, you know, center, center right in orientation to take uh, right wing political figures, right wing ideas very seriously, and often, you know, marginalized figures uh, on the left, progressive figures, and treat their ideas as sort of not entirely serious, uh, not worthy of coverage. So it's a huge problem. We don't really have the the full spectrum of ideas represented in the mainstream mainstream press on network news. If anything, we have a very truncated uh, spectrum where you know centrist ideas get some play and right wing ideas get a great deal of play, and the public just doesn't get much exposure to progressive alternatives to many um, sort of mainstream ideas. So the corporate media is playing a huge issue, and and you're right. If you if you read the newspaper, if you watch the evening news, it feels like over time there's been less and less uh, coverage of substantive issues, substantive developments, and and far more interest in sensationalism. Whether it's the you know latest antics of Marjorie Taylor Greene or some bizarre conspiracy theory that has taken off on the right. So there's been a sort of decided reduction in substantive news coverage with uh, with, with a much greater interest in sensationalism and. I suppose that makes some short-term business sense that attracts viewers, uh, that attracts uh, people online uh, on Facebook and YouTube. So if anything, the problem has only gotten worse over over time. Janae, do you think that the fourth estate is helping or hurting? I mean, we know that the fourth estate is still predominantly controlled, still predominantly a white male um, cishet uh, institution, um, but there have been calls for increased diversity. There have been calls for you know a, a more a more uh, a more kaleidoscope approach um, to what's actually important in the news. Where, where do you do you think the media is part of the problem or part of the solution? I guess that's. I mean, and I don't want to be. It, I'm not trying to force you into reductive false choices. Like, you, you get what I'm saying? <laughs> no, absolutely. And and of course, we can't paint all media with a broad sweeping brush. And there are independent, alternative, um, and and public. Uh, uh, venues and outlets that that do excellent coverage, and, and we should loud those. But on balance, uh, the media is certainly a significant part of the prob problem. And I think part of it is because of the corporate structure, which has already been discussed, but, but also, I, and perhaps even because of that, just a willingness to bastardize the uh, FCC's fairness doctrine and this both sidesism uh, and the false equivalence of so many issues to suggest that if we present one issue, uh, we must suggest that the opposing view, you know, deserves equal weight, equal credibility, and equal airtime. And that's part of the problem that we ran into with, um, you know, some of the the absolute extremist ideas that came out of the last administration and that continues to plague our democracy today. I mean, you know, the ACS sees it when people try to compare the ACS to the Federalist Society. And even though they, you know, are, uh, there, there are certain similarities in terms of the ways in which they work through law schools and with law students to influence the legal profession. They are, are in my mind, you know, quite distinct in terms of their approach and their interventions to manipulate certain um, certain processes uh, and, and, and political avenues in our democracy. So that is just one example that perhaps everyone watching this can appreciate uh, most acutely, but there are so many others that I could rattle off. And, and that to me is a significant problem with media, not to mention just poor uh, language choice and word choice and just a, a glossing over of, of complex issues in ways that I think do a great disservice to um, the threats that our democracy is facing. Josh, you and I are both, you know, relatively active on Twitter. We at least, you know, we have hands. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, so just so you guys don't disagree of your tweeting habits, and, apparently. Like. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, I got a new dog this weekend. Um, and my wife just got home from picking up her kids. So welcome to my life. Um, in any event, both of us are fairly active 
um, on on Twitter, Josh. I know, and I'm wondering, you know, do we think that social media um, is kind of helping or hurting this process? Process. You know, on the one hand, I do feel like social media is helping people kind of think differently, especially about legal concepts, which are are, are, are sometimes boring to people, right? I, I do think that social media kind of helps people kind of get engaged um, with some of these issues at a different way than they have before. On the other hand, social media also elected a, a, a bigoted con man as president. So, you know, six to one, half dozen to the other, right? So w where do you think um, social media is uh, is on this, on this scale um, of entrenchment? That, I mean, I, you know, I think that uh, this is going to sound really wishy-washy, right? It, it, it's, it's, it's good and it's bad, right? It's it, for exactly the reasons you identified. You know, I think it's, it's, I think it's great that there are so many sort of um, experts who, uh, you know, maybe in an earlier generation would have written the occasional op-ed or something, but who now really have sort of a large following. I'm thinking like, you know, Kevin Cruz, a, a historian, a 20th century historian at Princeton who has a huge Twitter following and has really used his following to sort of push back against, um, you know, famously, you know, getting in these wars with Dinesh D'Souza, but, but more generally about, you know, to try to give people a sort of picture of, you know, what 20th century American history actually looked like, um, uh, rather than the sort of sanitized, uh, you know, version that people who want to make America great again think was, you know, America. Um, so, I, you know, I think there, there is a real uh, upside in, in, in allowing people with that kind of expertise to, to get it out there. The flip side, of course, is that people who know nothing have, you know, find it equally easy to gain uh, a, a large audience. So, um, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, I think, you know, I tend to, I spend a lot of time reading, you know, uh, uh, late 18th century newspapers as well. So I, I don't think there's anything particularly unusual about our media environment, right? I mean, I, I think over the broad sweep of American history, the, the really unusual thing was the sort of mid 20th century consensus media. And the rest of the time, we've always had partisan sensationalist media. That's, that's, that's the norm um, in the United States, but it's also, I think, internationally the norm. Um, so I'm, I'm, the, 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 I have sort of targeted critiques of the media's role in all this, but I'm not sure that, the, that I, how much blame we can really lay at the feet of the, of the media or how much we can attribute sort of things that are new or, or, or different. <laughs> to the media. Look, I love me some John Paul Marat, right? Like that, I, <laughs> I'm with you there. And you're, you're absolutely right that people forget that, you know, up, outside the Cronkite era, um, um, this is, this is kind of how, this is the rough and tumble world um, of trying to, trying to, back in the day, trying to get those uh, subscriptions, right? Um, Kate, but are, is anybody learning anything? Right, like is like, you know, is the is the fourth estate helping people learn about the issues at play in their lives? And I'm thinking particularly with the, you know, with the kind of destruction of local journalism, um, as we try to educate people about the things that are infect that are affecting their own daily lives, is the media helping that project project at all? I think so. There's some really terrific investigative journalists, some really terrific, uh, um, tons of wonderful journalists working on lots of um, important issues. And I think increasingly covering issues around racial justice, around uh, workers' rights. Um, but clearly the structure of journalism is a problem. And that when I think we would benefit from a, much more public funding, um, uh, uh, including um, to help rebuild local journalism. Okay, I'm. Uh, we're about to go into the question section. So remember, if you have questions, please put them in the comment um, uh, field here on this chat, and we will try to get to as many as we can um, in a minute. But before we before we go there, my last question, and I did mention this online, but if uh, so, if you guys need more time, let me know. I was just kind of thinking to get you guys out of here. You get one amendment. You get the Twenty Eighth Amendment to, and in your idea is to do something that will make our politics smoother, that will break through the entrenchment, that will break through the gridlock. You get the 28th Amendment, wh what is it? Anybody who's ready, go. <laughs> Mandate independent redistricting commissions for both uh, the House of Representatives and state legislatures. So your, th your thought is that gerry you know, and gerrymandering, again, not addressed in our constitution, which uh, really tells you where their heads were at. Um, you think the gerrymandering is, is the thing that, that, that breaks some of this extremism um, easiest? I, 
I think it is. A, I think it would be a significant benefit to the country. I'm not sure. You know, by itself, you, you said I only got one. So um, by itself, <laughs> I don't think it would. It would. It would solve the problem. But I think it would be a, a, a big step. Well, well, I'll jump in and say that. Um, I've long resisted the idea of an amendment that creates an affirmative right to vote because um, I, I, I still firmly believe that the right to vote is fundamental, has been recognized as such by the Supreme Court, and an amendment in some ways undermine that presumption. But I do think, given the impasse that we are at now and what we see happening across the country and the wave of voter suppression bills, that we could perhaps benefit from an affirmative right to vote articulated in the Constitution and one that encompasses a definition and conception of the right to vote that would include um, prohibitions against partisan gerrymandering or anything that undermines the um, ability to cast a ballot and have it counted and have an equal ability to elect a candidate of choice. And that um, you know, would solve, I think, perhaps many of the problems that are being attempted to, to, to be solved by the For the People Act and the Voting Rights Advancement Act. But because we know we will not get that 28th Amendment, we need those two pieces of legislation passed. Yeah. I kind of like the idea of the 28th Amendment being like, the 15th Amendment, we mean it this time. Like, <laughs> for real. <laughs> Cater Cindy. I might be encroaching on Kate's lane here, but I think a constitutional amendment guaranteeing uh, an effective right to form unions, engage in strike activity, engage in boycotts would be tremendously helpful. So they actually, I actually push back a little bit against the uh, uh, gridlock impasse narrative. Uh, that's something we see when we have democratic control of government. When Republicans are in charge, they accomplish a great deal. Like impasse is not a word you see in the New York Times during Republican rule. And that's because you know, Republicans are ready to do uh, corporate America's bidding, and th there's no real uh, effective counterforce. And so when Democrats are in charge, big business exercises its behind the scenes veto rights. And unless we have strong institutions representing the multiracial uh, working class, I think this will continue where we sort of seesaw between uh, periods of Republican activism and then gridlock under democratic administrations. And I think we're seeing this again. We saw this in 2009, 2010. And unless we have strong labor organizations, which have historically been the most effective advocates for working people, this this is going to continue indefinitely. Kate? I second that. Um, and I think that that should be seen as connected uh, to the democracy reforms. I'm, having workers have real ability to organize and to have power in our democracy is, is related to the right to vote. It's not just about workers' rights, it's about having a healthy democracy. But I guess I would say, and so, so I would favor that amendment, um, but I do think we shouldn't put too much, um, we shouldn't look for an amendment to be a panacea to the problems um, that the country is facing. And it really takes a lot of hard work, um, a lot of organizing, uh, creative legal arguments, um, and looking at sort of the range of problems that the country uh, faces, rather than thinking that one little, one small reform is going to fix, fix things, or one big reform even. Excellent. So just to play the same game, um, mine, I'll go back to where we started. My amendment is abolish the Senate. And if I got to abolish Article 5 to abolish the Senate for like what, whatever it takes. Look, the Senate was the result of northern interests compromising with slaveholders to make sure that the slaveholders' interests weren't overturned by democracy. That's a terrible idea. That was a bad idea in 1787. It's been a bad idea the entire time, and it's a bad idea today. The, sen the Senate structure, which compromises with bad people so that they are represented more than other people, is just, it's untenable. I, I, I honestly believe that when, you know, aliens excavate what went wrong with the American hegemony, they will find, they will read Article 1 and be like, duh, that, that was never going to work. Huh. Like, you, we've got to get beyond that in some way. So with that, thank you so much for uh, this discussion. I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot. And now I want to go to some of the questions and comments that we have from our chat. Um, I think I will start with this because it kind of falls from our, uh, flows from our amendments discussion. And by all means, anybody jump in. 
Um, there's nothing in the Constitution that gives uh, SCOTUS the last word. Can that change? So this is a, I, I, will, I will reform this question as judicial review. That's not in the Constitution. <laughs> you know, is there any um, um, idea, thought here um, to just straight up overturn Marbury v. Madison and kind of go in a different direction? Well, I might, I might jump in here as the as the sort of designated court hater on the on the panel. Um, you know, I don't think this has to be about judicial review. It can be about judicial supremacism, right? It can be about not about the idea that um, you know, that, which is actually what Marbury says, where you know, if you've got a statute and you've got the Constitution, you've got a conflict of laws problem. You simply have to decide which takes primacy. That's very different than this sort of distinctly 20th century idea that the Supreme Court is the final word on the meaning of the Constitution. And especially after so many decades of the Supreme Court being the enemy. And again, I think, you know, this mirrors what I said about the media, but like there is a there is a, a, a couple generations of progressives that thinks that the Warren Court is like, the, the sort of archetype of the court as opposed to the one exception in American history, right? If, if we could just convince progressives to be a little bit less court worshiping, right? Um, uh, to be a little bit less judicial supremacist and therefore to be a little bit more willing to sort of treat the courts as something other than sacred, treat the courts as the political institution that they are, um, talk about them that way and therefore um, uh, sort of start to chip away at their authority, at their legitimacy. Um, I think the courts are, are are suffering from a surfeit of legitimacy in American constitutional society in American constitutionalism today, and and we are suffering for that. Um, so I think to, uh, you know anything we can do to make it clear that the courts are uh, political institutions and evil ones at that is is actually really to our benefit. Well, Anybody uh, else for uh, okay. against the uh, just doc? Go ahead. A Amen. Uh, I think we really need to lose our illusions about about the federal courts, uh, especially the Supreme Court. You know, I'll put on my legal realist hat and just say, judges are politicians in robes and the judiciary is elitist by design. If we actually believe in democracy, we should be committed to reducing the power of the judiciary and have the democratic branches, Congress and the presidency do the lion's share of policymaking in this country. Uh, the, the Supreme Court shouldn't be the sort of this junta operating uh, behind the scenes and threatening to overrule uh, let, uh, democratically enacted legislation. And Josh is absolutely right. I think the Warren Court hangs over too many of these discussions. It really was an exception. And it, it happened at a time when the country on the whole was moving to the left on a number of issues. So it wasn't really this brave, bold outlier. It was really following the country. And there was it's been almost 50 years since, uh, I guess, more than 50 years now since uh, Earl Warren uh, stepped off the court. And it was an exception. The Roberts Court is really a return to the norm in this country's history where the court upholds elite rule, white rule, corporate rule. And I think we need to be mindful of that history again. A lot of people don't know that, you know, our Supreme Court is one of the most powerful in the industrialized world. Right. You can't. The British High Court does not tell the House of Lords that their actions are unconstitutional. That's ridiculous. That's, that's the power of a king, not a court. Um, and our, our courts uh, uh, regularly exercise that power. I'll make I'll make a slight defense of our justocracy. Right. And, and the, the defense is simply the only thing that scares me more than nine white politicians in robes are like a thousand voters just doing what they want right like at some point you know my mother was my mother was born in 1950 in mississippi and as much as we want to talk about the warren court as the exception to the rule and you know it's not um it, it was a it was a brief moment in time like that was the only thing that was gonna stop them at that moment right not that it you know all deliberate speed and i don't want to get into how how quickly it stopped them, right? But like there, to me, there has to be some, and I don't want to sound like Plato, but there has to be some kind of restraint on just the unvarnished will of the people because sometimes the unvarnished will of the people is just wrong, right? But it was the representative. Right, right. The, sorry. <laughs> no, I mean, I'll jump in and, and, and make a defense here because I do think that there's... Um, uh, just too much focus on the Supreme Court alone. And I agree, history has proven that the Warren Court is an anomaly in the history of the Supreme Court. But um, there have been other decisions that lower courts have issued. And we, we, if we think about the docket of the Supreme Court and the small, small percentage of cases that it takes and the large number of cases that lower courts decide, um, there, 
there, I think, is a, a value in uh, relying on courts to resolve it, issues in what is probably the least political way, not apolitical, but least political way, at least in terms of its construction, um, that counterbalances so many of the ills that we have discussed today that infect our political process and allow for entrenchment. Now, again, the judiciary is not immune from that, but um, it is important for checks and balances that we do have these three branches of, of government operating in tension with one another. Um, none of them is perfect. And right now they're, they're all uh, uh, tilted in a single direction, which is quite concerning. Um, but I would be very loath to think about replacing the supremacy of the court without thinking through some of the other issues that we talked about today and overemphasizing our reliance on the congressional process as it currently stands. Um, okay, I want to ask this question. This is a little bit off topic, but I, I, it's always to me one of the most important things, um, especially um, coming off of what Sandeep and I were talking about in terms of, of why the world looks the way it does. Um, how can progressive spaces support law students more effectively, effectively uh, and tap into similar power that they, they who shall not be named um, does for its students? Um, um, and and how, how do we kind of get to that point? Because again, if we, if we talk about to me, if we talk about the ills of what our democracy is facing, it's so much of it is because we're fighting an asymmetrical war. And we've got, you know, one one side of the scale who will who will get them while they're young, who will go in and find their new stars and bring them up through their system. And, you know, it's like to pull like this. A guy like Neil Gorsuch is not born, he is created. And the Republicans will invest time creating the next Antonin Scalia or the next Neil Gorsuch, whereas the progressives are not spending time creating the next Thurgood Marshall or the next Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So how do we kind of reinvest um, in our own students, um, especially on these kind of uh, uh, difficult and yet critical legal issues? Okay, Josh, y'all teach people stuff. What do you <laughs> Kate, do you want to start with this? Sure. I mean, I, the ACS already does a host of things, and I think still more could be done, right? But I think, um, first of all, making sure that as we teach these foundational law classes, we don't teach them as sort of um, kind of gospel or sort of set in stone and encourage students to think critically about what the law is and how it affects uh, real people um, and not just take sort of cases handed down by the Supreme Court as kind of definitive and, 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 and not open for question. And same thing with sort of old common law doctrines, but rather to think critically about them. So that's one step sort of just foundational to kind of the process of teaching law, but then providing all sorts of ways of mentorship and support and connections. Um, and ACS has a lot of programs set up to do this already. There's also lots of new burgeoning organizations like law and political economy, uh, like various um, uh, kind of more grassroots movements designed to kind of foster uh, progressive um, activity among uh, law students. I mean, but we should be honest, like one of the major problems with law schools is it's just how great the tuition is. And so providing even more support for loan forgiveness um, and scholarship so that working class students can go to uh, law school and also so that students can dedicate themselves to progressive causes without being crushed by debt is, is essential part of this. Yeah, I think, that's, I think that's all right. I, I guess I would say that, um, you know, this and this may be an area where I actually sort of um, uh, think FedSoc may be, may be right in, in one descriptive way, which is that, you know, law school culture in general is left of center, right? The, the, the faculty of law schools, you know, they're not staffed with radicals, but, but, but it's a left of center culture. Law students uh, are, are in general a left of center bunch if you're comparing them to the sort of general American population. And so it's not surprising that there's sort of less energy put into progressive organizing in law schools because the conservatives and libertarians in law schools see themselves as, and I think correctly, as a minority and therefore, and, and you know, we, we public choice theory, right, teaches us that, that it's easier to organize a small group. Um, uh, so um, I, I think there's a sense in which um, it's actually not as necessary to, to do that kind of organizing on the left, right? The, 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 there is a deep progressive bench of people who might be, you know, young 
uh, progressives who, who who are well situated to be appointed to these positions. Um, so, and and I, I'm I'm not even sure I, I buy the idea that they're not sort of being groomed in some way. If you think about someone like Lena Khan, who's just been nominated to the FTC, right? I mean, she was identified in law school as an up and coming progressive star. Um, but I think that the, you know the, the the issue is really about who is being appointed when Democrats take power, as opposed to who's being appointed when Republicans take power, not whether or not the pipeline exists. I think it was always you know, not that hard to identify sort of who the, the young progressive lawyers out there were. Ellie, can I put in a quick plug? I, I, I wanted to pick up on Kate's point about crushing student debt and the idea of being very intentional about building a pipeline. Uh, the Legal Defense Fund proudly launched earlier this year the Marshall Motley Scholars Program. So when you ask, what are we doing to groom the next uh, Thurgood Marshall and the next Constant Baker Motley, we are investing in law students who want to pursue civil rights and racial justice work and who are committed to serving communities in the South by paying for their tuition, their room and board, and all ancillary costs and uh, placing them in fellowships post-law school in exchange for their commitment to serve communities in the South for the following eight years. So it's a 13 year program and you can find out more about it on our website, naacpldf.org. But I do think we need this type of financial intervention and hands-on intervention in terms of uh, uh, creating apprenticeships, if you will, for future civil rights and racial justice lawyers who then hopefully can become leaders in their own right in various capacities uh, in, in, in service of our democracy. That's a great point. And, the, and that's really the only pushback that I had to what Josh said is that while I totally agree um, that law students as a whole are left of center, they're also, you know, upwards of the poverty line by a considerable amount, right? Because of the cost and, you know, the cost of legal education and just the knowledge of, of, of kind of getting through college with enough, with a light enough debt load that you can even think about taking out the mortgage that is your legal education um, tends to skew um, the the student population, you know, towards you know more financially comfortable people. So I wanted to kind of go to Sandeep on this a little bit. You know, when you're talking about workers' rights and, and labor rights and poor people rights, are those really the rights that we're not seeing kind of passionately represented enough um, and, and need to do more cultivating? Yeah, I think that's right. And I'll depart from what Josh said a little bit. I actually think a number of subjects in law school are taught from a center center right perspective and reflect the almost hegemonic influence of law and economics which was a it was and is a conservative ideological project so courses like contracts property antitrust business associations they're uh, taught very much from a law and economic lens in general you know sometimes alternative perspectives are presented but the default is a law and econ framework and i think uh, many uh, even left-leaning law students understandably internalize that because that's all or most of what they hear. And so I think projects like Law and Political Economy, which Kate mentioned, are really important in challenging uh, conservative ideologies like law and economics, originalism, uh, not only exposing the false assumptions at the heart of these belief systems, but developing better, more empirically grounded alternatives. And, you know, I think certain there is this popular perception that law schools are left of center, but I don't think that's entirely right when you look at certain subjects. I think the second point is too often, I think liberal lawyers uh, adopt and even embrace uh, conservative notions of prestige. Like you're getting an appellate clerkship, working at a corporate law firm, these are seen as prestigious career paths. Whereas uh, becoming a plaintiff's lawyer or a legal services attorney don't carry the same cachet. So I think reinventing law school, producing more progressive lawyers will also involve a lot of self-reflection and uh, recognition that maybe we are actually perpetuating uh, a lot of harmful uh, narratives and encouraging students to pursue certain career paths at the expense of more socially beneficial career options. I'll just close with this story here since we're just about out of time. So my uh, torts professor was a law and economics person. He taught it very law and economics way. And so on the final exam, I get the question. And the question is, m people like Mr. Mistal will say <laughs> tort is a lottery system. Explain why he's wrong. Like that was the third question <laughs> on my final tort question. <laughs> and so, you know, being me, I was just like, actually, Mr. Mistal is exactly right. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Take that B. Sometimes it's worth it. Um, <laughs> thank you so much um, for joining us uh, for this panel today. Um, I really appreciate all the thoughts. Um, for those seeking CLE credit, the second and final code for today's panel is LAW20. That's L-A-W-20, which you can also find displayed at the bottom of the screen. As a reminder, you'll need this code and the code I provided earlier to qualify for CLE credit. Use the link posted in the chat box, which will take you to the form you must complete. Thank you so much to our panelists, Josh and Deep, Kate and Janae. I really appreciate it. Your thoughts, you guys were awesome. Thank you so much for ACS uh, to ACS for hosting us. And thank you so much for uh, Senator Feingold um, and uh, Secretary Mayorkas um, for their beautiful opening remarks. And uh, congratulations to Natasha Martinez again. Um, cheers, and you guys have a great um, rest of your day. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you, Ellie. Thanks so much. Thank you, Ellie, Kate, Josh, Janae, and Sandeep for that insightful and incredibly engaging discussion. And thank you to everyone for joining us today. I hope you'll join us for tomorrow's discussion on the meaning, mode, and value of accountability. Until then, take care. <laughs>